Hey guys, it's Craig Maynard. Happy New Year. Uh, down in the shop again. It's January 1st, 2019. It's a new year, as I mentioned before. Uh, time to think about the future and all the opportunities that this new year gives you, but it's also time to reflect on all the wonderful stuff that's happened to you in your past and some of the fun you've had. And to that end, I'd like to spend a few minutes and talk about some of my old designs that I put up with, uh, that I developed through all my years with my little electronics company, my little side company, as I was an instructor at SAFE for many years. This was kind of a way of keeping myself fresh and uh, and uh, up to date in the circuit design and evaluation, troubleshooting, all that kind of stuff. So let me have a look. Let me show you some of the circuit boards and how they came to be and what they did. Here's a sort of a shot of most of the circuit boards I've been involved in. Uh, a lot of the prototypes and earlier versions are missing from this, but it's still a good representation. And I think the first one I want to start with was this one right here. This is uh, called the, uh, this is a noisemaker. And this was made by me when I had a kind of a sole proprietorship called JCM Inventure, or JCM Electronic Services. It was just a sole proprietorship. And this little kit was made for the Canadian, for the Alberta Jamboree, which was a Cubs and Scouts uh, celebration that was being held in Alberta that year, 1997. And it was a little noisemaker. Now with this kit, what the kids would do is they would get a little pill bottle full of all the pieces inside, and they would put together one of these. This was a, this was the noisemaker kit itself, and it used uh, inductive, capacitive, resistive circuits, CLR circuits, and all these switches that would change the parameters of the circuit to produce thousands and thousands of different kinds of noises out this little speaker here. And they could also press these buttons to, uh, to turn the noise on and off. It was, uh, we called it a little combi kit. You can see right there, we had a little sticker in the bottom that people could put their names on them. So the Cubs and Scouts would make these things and then run all over the uh, woods experimenting with all the different kinds of noises it would make. That was a, that was a great introduction and that kind of gave me a few bucks for my company to get it going. And um, later on we had the Canadian Jamboree and the Canadian Jamboree wanted to have a kit as well. So we produced a second kit here. This kit here is called a uh, this is a little FM transmitter kit. We called it the CJ97 communicator. Okay, and this kit was a little uh, transmitter. You can see one right here. And it had a little microphone on it and uh, uh, some, uh, some uh, little transmitter circuit, a little antenna used to come off the backside. And you could tune it into an FM radio channel and then talk into the microphone and hear your voice on a, on a radio. It was kind of fun. It came with a little pin that you could actually mount the thing. You could actually wear it on your shirt, hang it off your shirt, and just press this little button every time you wanted to talk. And uh, that communicator was a lot of fun, too. We did a few hundred of those for the Canadian Jamboree. That was a great kit. Later on, they wanted to have a, uh, another kit um, made up for them. And so this one here I made was an artificial life form. It was called a Cybug. Uh, this is the Cybug uh, Scarab, I called it right here. And this kit was was a kind of a very simple kit based on a couple of 555 timers. And here's one of them all put together. And basically, it was a photo phototropic, which meant was attracted to light, or photophobic, repelled by light kit. There's a couple of cadmium sulfide photocells and two 555 timers. And it would either be attracted to light or be repelled by light, and you could control its activity with these two little potentiometers. Very fun little kit to build, and it looks very interesting when it's running around. It almost has a has a personality, an emergent behavior. So it could be attracted or repelled, and you control that with these little jumpers right here to make it one or the other. And this has been a fantastic uh, seller. We sold thousands of these little products over the years. You can see uh, just an easy to build little electronics kit. Now, once I had this kit here, uh, I, I expanded on it to um, create a sort of a robot that could, when it was uh, hungry, would actually move toward a feeding station. So I created this little add-on circuit board right here. And this is called the hunger board. And the hunger board would fit, would fit on the top of the robot like this. It would, you'd pop the 555 timer out, you'd plunk this thing down in its place, and, and what would happen is when the robot was uh, getting low on energy, it would become attracted to light and it would move toward a solar powered feeding station, kind of a robot plant. 
and it would charge itself up. And as soon as a battery got to a certain voltage, that uh, the board would make it afraid of light automatically, and it would run away from the light to protect itself in the dark. And then when it got hungry, it would just come back to the food source and feed again. So this was kind of like a, a robotic herbivore. And, uh, was, uh, and kids would also decorate these things with, you know, uh, pipe cleaners and fur and feathers and things to make all kinds of very interesting little insects on there with their herbivore. There was another optional add-on we had called a predator kit. This is the, the predator and the predator add-on, as you can see right here. Well, what this, what this board did was um, made this robot attracted to a herbivore. So when the, uh, when the robot itself started to be uh, low on energy, it would wait until another robot came by and then it would attack it. It would actually move toward that robot and try to couple the charge from that robot into its own, its own power supply. So that was the uh, robot predator add-on for the Cybug. Just plugged right on the top there. Another addition, after the Predator and the Herbivore addition here, I created this more sophisticated one here. This is called an Instinct Board. Now the Instinct Board here um, actually had a little microprocessor. I'll put this down. The Instinct Board had a little Atmel microprocessor on it and you could set the jumpers here on the side to be two modes of operation. It could be a hunger, a predator mode, or a herbivore mode. In the predator mode, um, these two sensitive infrared receivers, sharp infrared receivers, would look for infrared light and then charge toward the object that had the infrared light, um, feed off it. Now, uh, and, and that was really cool. If you had it set for herbivore, then these two cadmium sulfide photocells would look for a food source uh, where the light is, that's where the food source would be, move toward the food source. And these two transmitters here and here, they would uh, they would emit infrared light and attract the predators. So you could so you could imagine a very cool little robotic ecosystem being set up with plants and per herbivores and predators all interacting with each other. That was the instinct module. Another little kit that I made uh, along that lines was the queen ant. And here's a here's a queen ant circuit board right here. Of course, I've got the two flavors. I've got the black ant and the red ant. And here's one all built up. The queen ant was uh, basically a very simple, uh, again, uh, herbivore that could move toward the light sources and gather energies, but it was much, much faster and more sophisticated, and it, was, it made a great line follower too. And another thing that I did with the queen ant, which was kind of interesting, was I designed it so you can pop off this circuit board right here, and into this module right here, you plugged in a basic stamp one, a little parallax uh, basic stamp one, and you could program this robot to do whatever you wanted to with that uh, with that basic stamp. And again, uh, it could it could run off a large capacitor, uh, maybe a aerogel capacitor, ten or twenty farads, and use it as an energy source and see if it can feed itself and keep itself going. So that was called the Queen Ant, and I had uh, two of those, the uh, the black one and the red one. Another kit that I really enjoyed was a was a really fun kit to make was this little guy right here. This is a a very simple little engine uh, little kit called a flitter bug. And what the flitter bug allowed you to do was to create a very simple charge pump, which meant it was a a, a little circuit that would gather energy from the sun, charge up a series of capacitors, and then discharge them across a motor. Now these flitter bugs could be put together in an animal form or a plant form. Uh, this is an example of a flitter bug in an animal form. So you can see here the capacitors, the motor that's on there, and the motor's going down to this little wheel. And when you put it on the ground, when the solar energy uh, charges it up, it just starts to move all across the ground on its own, like a little single-celled amoeba animal. Right? You could also reverse it so uh, the motor was facing up, as you can see right here attach onto it a little butterfly which came with the kit or a flower or something like that and then as the as the light fell on the robot uh, the motor would spin sporadically and make that little bug turn and there was all kinds of little additions you could make you could make this into a floating robot or a little uh, a, uh, a jitter bug if you want all kinds of different little modifications of this basic solar engine now the heart of the solar engine right here is called my own circuit design called a chloroplast and that's the little 
That's the circuit right there. You can see it's just got uh, two semiconductors on it, a place for a large capacitor and a place for a solar cell. And this is the very simple circuit that uh, creates this charge pump. And I have, uh, I, ha I made those circuits. I attached them onto this robot kit, which used a chloroplast. It was a, uh, it's called the SolarFly 1. And the SolarFly 1 had two glass um, solar cells. It went right there, a couple of photo cells on it for sensors, uh, some antenna out front, and it would move around looking for light sources, but it was totally, totally solar powered, where the Cybug and the Queen Ant were mostly, um, mostly powered by battery. Now this is my first solar fly, and uh, every solar fly, because I had kind of a funny shaped board, I attached uh, a few of these little modules onto them and uh, broke them off and gave them away separately if person wanted to build their own charge pump. And I sold thousands of those. Um, and then I changed the design a little bit with the help of uh, uh, one of my colleagues, um, Evan Hackler, who's a brilliant young fella, great designer. We built this uh, circuit right here. This is called a uh, SolarFly 2. Now this one's a much, much nicer looking board, much more organic and round in its shape. And it produces a solar powered robot like you can see right here. This is the SolarFly. And it's got a couple of, um, couple of wings on there. You can attach on, you can see the solar cell right here so it could run totally solar. And there's the, photo, there's the uh, light sensors for the eyes and a couple of touch sensors for feelers, for obstacle avoidance. But the other cool thing about this was it also had battery clips right here. So if you wanted to, you could plug a nine volt battery in there and use it uh, in the room uh, if there's not enough light for the thing to operate solar and have some fun with it. So it actually operated in battery or solar, kind of a hybrid. So solar fly is really popular and I, I just love these kits. Sold a, sold a great number of those over the year and always enjoyed building them. They were a lot of fun. So the solar fly is a, a, a very educational kit, you know, it shows you how to solder and basic principles of electronics and things like that. But uh, it does, th there's another kit that I put together called a Hornet. And this is an example of the circuit boards for the Hornet. They're beautiful circuit boards. And these ones were meant to teach you how to uh, solder uh, surface mount components, how to actually solder surface mount components. And uh, never really sold so well. I don't think people really interested in learning how to solder the surface mount, which is a shame because it's very easy to solder and a lot of fun. But this was a, you can see it was another kind of a phototropic insect that would move back and forth. And then this little circular one broke off. This was called a Smarty. And uh, it had a couple of little LED eyes and it was a multivibrator. The eyes would flash back and forth uh, as it sat on a uh, nine volt battery on two little springy legs. And it was just an example of uh, another surface mount practice. So uh, originally we called this thing the dragonfly and eventually I looked at it and we decided it looked more like a hornet than a dragonfly. So we, we changed it to hornet. Good old hornet. So another thing that I, I did uh, since I was an instructor at SAIT and I taught uh, in my early career there, I taught uh, electronic theory and digital lo logic and things like that. I, um, I created a, a very simple circuit board called uh, a Vulcan. So the Vulcan is basically a digital logic trainer. As you can see right here, the Vulcan was meant to fit on top of a, a breadboard like this. Had four binding posts with power supply, five volts and ground, it had digital switches, uh, digital LEDs for monitoring it. It had a, a square wave generator based on 555 timer where you can set the uh, duty cycle and the frequency. It had a logic probe, red and green, so you could do your digital monitoring and uh, just a nice little single unit that could be carried around by the students and all their digital work showed up on there. Uh, it's also, this version's also got a seven segment display and a little speaker, uh, which isn't mounted on this particular kit. But this was a very popular kit. And again, it sold thousands and thousands of these. This was a lot of fun. I also have a, uh, a simulation of this online, I have an electronic uh, Windows based simulation of the circuit board that actually worked and the breadboard. So you could put all your digital logic chips here and control them with your virtual Vulcan. And that's what I called it, the virtual Vulcan. And you could actually put faults in the logic chips too and troubleshoot them. So I really enjoyed uh, the virtual Vulcan and uh, got a lot of use out of that. Of course, I call them Vulcan because if you want to learn logic, you should learn it from a Vulcan. 
just for fun, I got to, this was a very, very early prototype I did when I was just a few years into SAIT of the, uh, of the first Vulcan. And from there, I sort of built together, I hand etched a little circuit board right here. Originally, I called it a Spock, but I didn't think that would, uh, it would work too well. But that's the original Spock right here, the Spock Logic Lab. It's, it's sat in a little VCR case. Remember VCRs? It's a kind of a, a way of holding it. And there's, I made a little more advanced version of it <laughs> called the Spock 2. And these were all done just one off on my own, uh, I got etched my own boards. But of course, eventually I had the Vulcans put together uh, professionally and it taught me a lot about circuit board design and manufacturing and those kind of guys. I had a couple of additions for the Vulcan. Uh, this one is the advanced digital module. And the advanced digital module, um, here's a populated one you can see right here. It had debounce switches, a couple of seven segment displays, uh, a, a better logic probe, and a single shot high and low pulse circuit or uh, a uh, debounce. And they had these four plugs on there, so it would actually plug on the top of the Vulcan trainer, right like that, and give you more functionality. This is the analog trainer. This is the Vulcan analog trainer. And the analog trainer, uh, again, was an add-on. And uh, it had a function generator on it. So it could do square wave, triangle waves, sine waves, um, all those kind of things. And it had a, a dual variable power supply, plus and minus 12 volts. So it could actually produce uh, uh, differential voltages for used in op amps, used in op amps and things like that. So those are the Vulcans. I actually I couldn't even find an analog trainer circuit board anymore. Um, again, these didn't really sell very well. I, I sold lots of Vulcans, but not so many of the add-ons. Um, and and um, I also put together a couple other little circuit boards that were useful here. Um, this one right here, where is it, this guy? When I was teaching digital logic, I also taught complex programmable logic devices. So I had an Altair uh, CPLD plugged on this circuit board right here and it was an inexpensive little circuit you can see right here and it allowed you this got guys to program thousands and thousands of uh, nat uh, gates that are inside this chip and wire them up any way they wanted to do very complicated circuits using this inexpensive Altera CPLD and it had all these uh, an IDC connector on the bottom so it basically could plug right onto the circuit board right onto the circuit board and people could experiment with their uh, CPLD device. This version of it had a interface that plugged into the parallel port of your computer for programming. Uh, nowadays, of course, we'd have probably have to use a, a JTAG interface or something like that to program it, since there's not many parallel ports left. Now, one of my, another one of my favorite, uh, favorite kits is this little motor controller, right? Where is my motor controller? Yeah, I think it's there. There it is. These are the motor controllers. Here's a single version of it. That's an L298 motor controller that you can uh, you can plug into large motors up to 48 volts and several amps. Uh, and uh, that was just kind of a useful little accessory kit right there. I really love this one. This was a this was a really fun kit that, that we designed and Evan and I brainstormed. It's called the Samurai. It's a, it's a mini sumo robot kit based on an Atmel microprocessor. And it also makes a really nice little Atmel microcontroller development board. So um, this is what it looks like when it's done. Uh, you can see here the circuit board is meant to be attached by these little brass wires. And then you can bend it, bend it like that, and attach it, attach it onto a Tamiya gearbox very nicely. And a little battery goes on top. And you've got, on top of that, an L298 motor controller again. So it's a very powerful motor controller. Could do a much larger motor than is on these kits. But it also makes a very nice little development platform for programming uh, Atmel microprocessors in, in C or machine language using AVR Studio. So this, was a, this is a really great little uh, kit. Still like, still like it today. Makes a great sumo wrestling robot, but it also teaches you so many other things. Now. Uh, we've also put together with this uh, a side uh, software package called the Sumo Sensei. It's a, it's a program that runs on Windows and allows you to pr uh, create an uh, operating system for this thing on uh, using sliders. And then you could 
compile the operating system into in well creates a C code which you can look at and then it compiles it and downloads it to the the actual uh, robot so you can you can watch the robot run so that was called the Sumo Sensei and uh, that was another really really interesting kit so as you see I've been keeping myself busy I really enjoy doing electronic circuit boards and designs uh, to this day and uh, I want to thank you guys for letting me indulge and talk a little bit about all of these little circuits that I've been involved in all these years. So um, I want you guys to have a great new year and um, and thanks for watching.